Hey, welcome everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Study Wealth Podcast. And today we're just going to shoot the breeze about the markets, which is as Brian, uh, we'll get to him in just a second, just said it's the best thing we can do. And I actually agree. These formats of just shooting the breeze about the markets, what's the top of mind, can actually be very, inf maybe even more informative than other formats sometimes based on where, if there is any thoughts at all that we have or, or what's going on in the market. So Brian, welcome back. Hey, thanks. Appreciate the invite. Have you been? Everything good? Everything's good down here in central Florida. I see you're wearing a UCF shirt. What's yeah. the what's the record so far? We are three and oh. Nice. And we play Kansas State at Kansas State this weekend. It's our first big twelve. I was gonna say, because you probably haven't had any real games yet. I mean, <laughs> just the way just the way the season works, right? That's true. We've had yeah. a lot of nice, easy wins. Did you have one of those? 61 and 0 games. <laughs> we beat a few teams pretty bad. We played Villanova last week. We're excited. I'm not, I have very low expectations. Really? <laughs> Kansas State won the conference last year. So, yeah, it's, so it's from that tough. perspective. Yeah. But, you know, three and one would still be a good start. So four and 0, would, I'll be loud. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You'll wear like a, do you have a hoodie you could wear on top of that shirt as well? We'll probably find one. <laughs> <laughs> mittens. Yeah. That's you see right. you have mittens. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, and I'm still getting used to these braces, by the way. I was telling people to get these visible braces. Anyway, it's all good. Look, we're here in the second half of September. We're you know pushing towards the sort of the final stretch for the month. And seasonality-wise, this actually tends to be one of the weaker periods of the year. What's top of mind? And you know, we'll, we can go much more granular, but just yeah. top of mind, equities, fixed income, whatever. Sentiment. Yeah, yeah. In terms of interest rates, what's mind boggling to me is how high the 10 year bond has it reached like a it touched an all time high at four and a half percent yesterday. Yeah. And so that's pretty pretty interesting to me. And then also what the Fed did on Wednesday with pausing the rates, which wasn't a surprise at all, but the post the presser where he, he was, came off really hawkish and sunk the market for really a day and a half because yesterday was a pretty uh, ugly uh, day for the market as yeah. well. And, uh, and j just so you know, like this is going to air on Monday, the 25th. So if you're, we're recording this here on Friday, the uh, 22nd. So when you refer to yesterday, you're talking about okay. the, the uh, Thursday, the 21st. And yeah. just in case people are watching this and are wondering, this doesn't, take anything away from it doesn't sure. matter what happened yesterday it's more mm -hmm. the broad sort of yeah. idea yeah and but just quickly touching on the bond since you brought that up i'm sharing a screen and for the audience that's listening to it, it's a regular podcast hubs so you won't see the chat the chart but you'll of course hear us describe it so you don't worry about missing anything and if you're watching this on youtube of course you can see the chart so anyway but basically what i'm showing here can you see the chart i can yeah so this is the 10-year yield and as you said before, we reached a new multi-year high in yields. Last time we saw four and a half, 10 year was back in 2007. I think even I can do that math. That's about 15 years ago. One of the things that I keep thinking here and, and, and love to see hear your input, but my sort of base case here is that we're probably overshooting and then maybe going to mean revert. And let me just qualify what that means. I don't see us rates going back to zero. I think central banks have learned that's a silly thing to do. But ultimately, if you look at these changes, so if you look at 10-year yields in a very long-term chart, and what we're talking about here is literally looking back to the early 1900s, there was a big sea change shift that happened in the early 80s. And you probably remember this better than I do, Brian, because you, you're, you're a couple of years older. And so what happened was we had higher, much higher rates from basically the, 50, the 40s, so basically coming out of World War II, into the early eighties. And then it took a couple of years of kind of seesawing back and forth until we really had a confirmed downtrend in yields. But what happened as we changed, as we intersected from that massively rates went from 2% to 15% from the fifties to, to the, the early eighties. It's almost unimaginable at this point. Now, is that going to happen again? I don't know. I would imagine you don't know. No one has a crystal ball, right? Okay. But what I can tell you is that there's going to be a, a change in, in direction that's not going to be very smooth. So even if we're going to be in a higher for longer environment, once we see an economic cool off, and that's not a matter of when, it's a matter of if, 
it is extremely likely that we will first see rates go back lower again, not to zero, not to one on the 10 year, but maybe two, two and a half, three, I don't know. And then you start going creeping higher again. Well, what do you think about that? And I know that's a big macro call. No one knows, but yeah. just broadly speaking. Yeah. I mean, I would think that's a pretty solid thesis. Um, <laughs> it's gone. Like you said, we've overshot how far we've gone in such a short period of time. So a pullback from these levels wouldn't be shocking. But on the other hand, I do see it creeping up. And I also agree that we're not going to get down to a zero rate probably in our lifetime. Yeah. So if we're not going back to zero in our lifetime, and again, we haven't had zero, the lowest rates ever were before then was about two back in 1942. My dad was born that year. I think, or I think it was in 1940. It was more or less at the end of the war, World War II. A lot of this stuff has to do with mean reversion. So if we were to look at breaking below those lows, like we really only broke below the 1940s, the 2% 10 year lows and actually stayed below there for a few months, a few quarters during the pandemic. Like that's before we never had that never happened before. And I don't have the bond market going earlier than 1914. So I don't know exactly where they started trading 10 year yields. Like probably a good history book I should read on that. Either way, it, you say that rates may not go back to zero or even below 2% or 1%, then I would agree. But on the other hand, do you think there's a chance of us going, getting to the point where we have 6 7% considering the fact that we have to somehow finance our debt? That'd be tough, wouldn't it? I, I sure hope not. I, I, I would love to see it land in that 2 to 3% range because mm -hmm. um, I think that everybody wins in that kind of situation. Mm -hmm. A 6% landing at 6% makes everything so much harder to be profitable and people can't afford cars, homes, credit card bills, student loans. All those things are really going, people are really going to struggle and that will affect the economy, right? People have to pay higher credit card bills, car loans, ha house payments. And um, so that, to me, that would be a really tough situation for the economy and for the stock market overall. What about timing? So we, we, we're <laughs> looking at a chart that goes back to the <laughs> early 1900s where we're, covered, where, where we're still living in a world where most people look at five minute charts, right? So obviously this is a big history lesson or, but what about looking at this through more of a near ish to intermediate term lens? So you and I both agree and everyone can draw their own inclusion if Brian and Serge agree, maybe they should do the opposite. <laughs> yeah. But let's assume we're somewhere right and, and rates top out around four and a half. Maybe we squeeze to five if the algos like it. And there's a lot of bonds coming to the market, which is actually where I want to get to here in a second. But let's say we, we're right and we see a pullback to two, two and a, between two and three. And that's a big range, right? In, in the mm -hmm. bond world. But let's just see that. And then we, we maybe trickle higher, push higher. Right. Let's assume that happens. In the near term, one of the reasons we've seen this big push higher, in my view, talking to bond people every week, for one, we've had a lot of issuance. After we had the debt ceiling breached and it finally got resolved in June, the treasury was able to issue bonds again. And they had to short, issue a lot of short-end bonds, which is easily digested because it goes all into money market paper. But then they started having to issue stuff out with duration, which is one of the reasons why you saw 10-year yields go like crazy. So what basically happened to the yield curve, and I know I'm getting a little bit wonky here and a bit dorky on this, but we've essentially seen the yield curve getting, getting steepening, re-steepening. Yeah. Not, it's not steep. We have, we still have an inverted yield curve. And basically the way it looks like right now, we're, we have a 10, a negative 65 base point, basis points spread between 10 year yields and two year yields. Right. So what that means is that 10 year yields yield 65 basis points less, so that's 0.65%, than two-year yields. The reason I'm bringing this up is because there's a technicality here in the near term that has pushed these yields up of the issuance of bonds, right? So there's a lot of paper to have to be absorbed. And in a world where the Japanese and now the Chinese and who knows what other countries are trying to gang up against the West are less inclined, at least marginally, to buy treasury yields. Right at bonds, that is going to naturally put some upper pressure on yield. Yeah, I would agree. I think you could see the in the near term, it push up. I, I'd be real surprised if it rolled over five. But 
to see a pullback within the, by the end of the year down to the three and a half, four, back to where it bottomed out on that short-term pullback, I wouldn't be surprised. I would be shocked if it pushed over five and stayed over five going into the end of the year. And for those people that are that are equity people, stock people, and you only care about your stocks, this is we're talk we're bringing this up because we're going to get to stocks. Like this actually is really important for stocks, and I'll show you this. We'll talk about this in a minute. But just last point on this, Brian, and and I think this is something that we need to understand about how the Fed works. And I'm, I'm not, I don't like to Fed go on Fed bashing grants. I think that's silly because it's a tough job, and honestly, yeah. I wouldn't want to be there. They have I don't know how like literally. I read this the other day and I, and I, I'm, good to, I'm totally going to miss this number but by about 100 people, but I thought they have 100 plus economists or 200 economists. Like at the, I mean, it's crazy, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not like they don't do anything. They've got their models. They're trying to steer a massive, mahusive aircraft carrier. It's, this is a tough job. Very tough. However, let's talk a little bit about, for example, the most recent Fed meeting. So for those people listening to this once, we released this podcast on Monday, the 25th. It'll be last week for us, you and I talking here on Friday. This was early this week. The Fed's meeting where they basically basically came across very hawkish. And let's talk about the jawboning effect. Because I think this is also something that's a little bit, I don't know if it's underappreciated, but maybe not talked about enough. So you think about, and you can parse through this. You, you can take Powell's speech and put it into chat GPT and make it all sorts of analysis, do all, all sorts of analysis. But if you keep it very simple and you think about if the Fed really doesn't want to hike rates much further, why not go ahead and job in the market higher? Because as of when we're here, we're recording this your Friday morning before the open of the, of the market on the 22nd of September, 10-year yields have literally, as you say, they're basically 4.5% as of right now. Who knows where they are by Monday when this is a podcast. But that's not because of any interest rate hikes. It's because the Fed basically spoke hawkishly. Yep. Yeah, that's true. So that's something else we have to keep in mind. So let's take all this and I'm going to make another chart and we'll describe this in great detail. Let's talk a little bit about, before we go back into near term, let's look at the market through the lens of longer term cycles. And I'm talking about like the past 30, 20 years, let's say at least, and why equity markets have had this upper pressure and maybe what that means going forward. So I'm just going to quickly create a very simple chart and what it's going to be Brian is I'm just going to look at the S and P 500 and where's this chart here? I'm trying to create this thing here. Okay. And what we're going to look at is what bond yields have done over the course of those 20 years versus the stock market. And again, the reason we're doing this is to make people understand that Gosh, there's probably a correlation there or a lack of correlation. So two lines on the chart. And again, I'm, we're going to describe this. So if you can't see this because you're listening to a traditional podcast, you don't, you're not missing a thing. Basically, I think you and I can both agree the equity market, the S&P 100, since the 80s, early 80s, when we started talking about before, when we started peaking out in yields, the S&P has basically gone higher. Like For sure. There's, there, we had secular bear markets. Like we had a big one where the internet bubble popped from the year 2000 to the year 2013, there was two cyclical bull markets and two cyclical bear markets within that. But overall, since the 80s, so that's basically early 80s, so that's 40 plus years, right. yields have gone lower. Now, first of all, why have yields gone lower? Well, it, it's your fault, Brian. You're a baby boomer, right? Barely. I yeah? am, yep. I so am. it's the boomer generation. Is, right. and, and, and I'm, of course, kidding about this being <laughs> anyone's fault, but this, it's that, right? So we've had bond yields basically go from 15%, as we said before, to at the absolute COVID lows, basically zero on the short end. And the equity market, so multiples go higher. Why does that happen? It's basic DCF, discounted cash flow models. So you have lower interest rates. So when you take the net present value of a future cash flow is going to be worth more if you discount it back with lower interest rate. Right. So you can make the argument that yes, the economy grew, the boomers, or spending and you know, lower interest rates, all that kind of stuff. But ultimately, lower rates also meant the equities had an, a natural tailwind. Yep. If you and I are right, and we're going to be in a somewhat, and because I, I, I would like to modify the Fed's words, and the Fed's words are not talking about five, 10 years. They're talking about they look over barely over their skis because no one can really be on their skis anyway, to be honest. But they're looking at a couple of years. But let's big picture. Let's assume we have yields that are going to be Definitely, let's say above 2% for the foreseeable future, like five, 10 years. 
like the equity market is not going to continue to go vertical like it has for the past 13 years. This is like where I'm done. That's my spiel here. Let me know what you think. And this is what I want to get. This is what I want this podcast to be about. What do you think about that? Yeah, I would say the higher the interest rates move, and as long as they stay at these elevated levels, it's going to be a tremendous headwind on the market. On top of that, you got all kinds of other headwinds coming at at the equity market. I agree. I think it's a the history shows us when interest rates go down, the equity market generally goes up. And what we're seeing now is, and the inverse is true as well. When rates go up, the equities have a lot of, they struggle to, to deliver great results. So that's my, uh, I don't see that changing. And I think the longer rates stay up or keep going up, the harder it is for companies to show continued growth and their equity and their stock price will be reflected in that. And, and the other thing that I always look at is shorter term. We got through last year was a crappy year for equities. We blasted higher in the first few months of this year, but in the last three months, we're actually totally flat in the in equities. My thinking, it, I know this is shorter term, but will we oh, see profit taking going into the end of the year saying, hey, the, the S&P is up 15% year to date. Why am I going to watch it? go back down to eight and just see all that profit just evaporate. The S&P 500 is actually completely flat. In fact, it's like now it's, it's down a little Negative, bit yeah. for the past two years. So on a two year time horizon, yeah. right? So you're talking about three months and, and it's great, but, and, and it's, it's funny. I had this discussion early this morning with Mark. You remember Mark? Oh yeah. Fun guy. We were talking this early this morning and we were talking about this just real, for all, for one, real, real returns in the S&P. Let's talk about that. That's taking the actual return, subtracting inflation is not good. <laughs> so over the past couple of years, but forget real, let's forget inflation for a minute, which is hard because everything has gotten more expensive, but the actual returns that people see in their portfolio is flat. And I think Fine. people are, and you and I had, you and I had this discussion, Brian, I'm going to argue we had this discussion at the first time about a year and a half ago. And I think we both said, as we saw rates start to go higher, it's going to take the average investor, probably two years. I remember that specifically talking about this with you to realize that they have not made money. And I think people would have realized it earlier if it wouldn't have been for COVID where people came out of COVID. You've had a good travel year. I've been in a few places where all wanted to get out and do stuff. Yep. So people said, screw it. What my portfolio, damn my portfolio. I'm going to travel mm -hmm. the grandkids I've never seen or whatever and do all that kind of stuff. So. <laughs> These braces, man. <laughs> but, but so that's, so people have forgotten, but I think now yeah. that this is all over, they're looking at their portfolios and saying, you know what? I have many money in my end. And my question, my answer to that question, or at least my response is what about bond yields? You can literally make risk-free and, and, and risk-free is if, the, unless the government defaults over the next six months, which yeah. is who knows, I'm going to say there's an extremely low chance of that, but right. you know, I'm sure there's always a, a couple of dark souls out there that would argue against that. And fine, I'm fair enough. We want to see both right. sides, but let's right. see that doesn't happen. You're making five and a half percent risk-free. Yep. The other thing that, that I'm looking at your chart surge, mm -hmm. if I was in the market two years ago and saw an experience and held through last year's returns, and we got, we're back up to where we were two years ago, my first, or a common expectation at this point is I need to get the hell out. I don't want it to go back down again next year. Yeah. And that Do you will... feel like there's a lot of people that, that are like, when you talk to people, I know you and I talk to people every day, right? Do you hear that rationale? I Cause I, I have not heard as much. I haven't, I've heard it some. I hear that. And I also hear like we're interest rates, everything is, you got the you got this conflict with China, you got the war in Ukraine, you got, you name a hundred things, you got a possible government shutdown on mm -hmm. October 1st. So people are, to me, very fearful that we'll see another year like we saw last year. Got and what they're saying is, I can get, like you said, I can get a 5% bond. I can put money in a 
a six month CD. Yeah. Why the hell would I put myself through what I went through last year? Yeah. So what I'm showing right now, and again, I'm just describing this in case for those people that are, that are not seeing the chart. And again, you're not missing a thing. I'm just describing it. So two year yields right now are 5.1% as of today. Let's go into a, a six month T bill yield. Right. So let's just do some simple math. And I did a, a, a few YouTubes on this and videos over the past couple of weeks on this. So this is the, the reason I like the podcast format is it gives us more than the typical three, four or five minutes. It gives us the 20, 25 minutes, however long, and just chat a little bit about this a bit more detail. But so right now this is six month yields or five and a half percent, let's call it. So let's assume how much does the S&P make on average over the past 90 years, uh, total return per year is about 9%, not quite. Hmm. Over the past 15, 16 years, the s and made about, sorry, over the past 12, 13 years, the S&P's returned about 15% per year. So that's 50% above average. So if we've gone to 50% above average for 12 years, we're probably going to have to go 50% below average or for the next t five, 10 years. Simple mm -hmm. math gets you to an annual return of about 5% for the S&P. That'll mean there'll be some better and some worse years. Let's assume a, a client wants to make the target 10% per year, which is a good number, by the way. During the pandemic, everyone was talking about 50% returns, but those people were new to the market. Let's put it that way. <laughs> anyway, I, I, either way, be that as it may, five and a half percent risk-free right now. Let's call that. And again, there's three in the parentheses in case anyone wants to leave some hate comments. Five and a half percent risk-free. So all you have to do, and, and this is not easy, right? But to make 10, you have to make another four and a half somewhere, somehow in equities, right? It's a lot. You, you, the point is you have to take a lot less risk yep, yep. to make 10%, like a crazy amount less risk than you had to a year and a half ago. Yep, for sure. And, like a year and a half I, ago, it was all equities yet. It was, it, there was no other play. It was all equities. Yeah, I see a lot, more, like you asked, like when we talk to people, I hear a lot more people talking about fixed income, bonds, yeah. than I ever have, probably in the last 10 years. Interesting. And to put this into global perspective, just to throw a couple of more wonky things in there, it's actually not wonky. This is really basic stuff. But if you compare... Let me quickly try to make some sense out of this. What if we compare global yields, like just to see, just so, so people know how nice we have it here in terms of uh, stateside, in terms of yields. Again, we talked about, let's say, let's say you take a one year bond just because of what I have here. That's 5.45, let's call it five and a half percent. In Germany, they have 2.75 and their inflation rate was just as crappy. Yeah. Yeah. That's right? amazing. So that's pretty good. It's so you think about high. It's wise to now, of course, a German investor that's getting paid in euros can buy treasuries, but then there's, of course, currency risk, right? Yeah. But as a U.S. domestic investor, and there's ways of hedging that, by the way, which we always talk about that at Blue Marlin with our clients, which shameless plug. If you haven't uh, reached out to us at Blue Marlin Advisor, go to Blue Marlin Advisor, singular, bluemarlinadvisor.com. Anyway, I just, want, I just thought it's worth pointing out the difference in yield. That's amazing. Lot. Yeah, that's eye-opening there. Yeah, it really is. So I mean, this, let's go back to really short term to wake people back up in case we put them to sleep with bonds <laughs> and then we'll wrap it up. Big bull projection. What do you think equities and for from here, fourth quarter, we're heading towards the fourth quarter here really fast. What do you think? Lower, flatter? I think we will be flat. I think we'll see a lot of a push higher, a push lower. I think if the Fed wants to push the rate equities higher, they can, they know they can, but yeah, sure. they, they don't, they really are focused on inflation. So I don't really see that happening. So I see a, a sideways drift into the end of the year. With some volatility, maybe a VIX With a at, lot of volatility yeah, kind of okay. bouncing around. VIX, VIX around 20s or maybe high, low teens, sorry, yeah. high teens, low 20s, yeah. that kind of thing. Yeah, I think I could see it at teen uh, uh, for the Vic. I think we'll, it'll be a kind of a bump, as they tell you on the plane, we'll have a bumpy ride, put your seatbelts on. But I think we'll get where we're at now, basically. That's my guess. And because every time there's a dip, there's always some new buyers stepping in. And uh, we're even seeing it on Friday. After two days of sell-off, the, the pre-market futures are up. And that's my picture. I think if we can see inflation, some really good progress there, people will get excited again. Uh, when there's bad news or pessimism about in inflation and the economy, we saw it last week, right? 
Yeah, and so that's maybe an interesting point to, to end on. We're at a point in the cycle where economic data is getting worse, but it's not falling off a cliff yet. Right. And it's, it's probably going to be like one crappy headline, whatever it is, that's going to basically get bond yield down in a hurry. But I do wonder if it's not somewhere in the cards still that if we start getting a really, I'm going to say dovish data, what that means in English is basically, let's say a good report that inflation is coming down hard, which it is, right? It's just according to the Fed and some things, look, it's not everywhere. I wonder if that will get the animal spirits running for equities one more time. Because again, it's, it's a multiplier, right? So the discount rate, you have to think about right. what that means, the DCF model we're talking about for. Yeah, I think that's the exception to that prediction. Like something really dovish or really bullish yeah. comes out. You might see a run into the end of the year, December being extremely strong. But on the other hand, all of the economic data coming out has been pretty bleak I and mean, not terrible, but not the, terrible. That's, and that's the thing, right? So it's almost, yeah. I think, and I, I was like an, a year early in this, literally, like I really thought that about a year ago that economic data would start to accelerate to the downside. But right. then again, what I didn't, and I th honestly, probably a most Wall Street economists, and I'm not an economist, right? But all the big shops, they were pretty good, got that wrong as well. Cause it just wasn't, it was hard to get our head around how people would just, spend money for one more year and how much you, I think we all had underestimate how much money people were, were saved, even if they didn't get anything from the government during COVID. I, I know I saved a lot of money and you and I were just holed up in our offices during COVID, right? <laughs> Couldn't go anywhere. And it was sad, but we saved a lot of money, right? <laughs> yeah. That's right. So that's the, for those of us who could do that, it was fortunate, but then now we had two years of spending it. But I think now we're at a point, I'm mean, again, I said this one year ago, so take it with a grain of salt. By the way, you mentioned before about when you step on an airplane, um, and they say something that's going to be a bumpy ride. <clears throat> Don't you hate that? <laughs> it's like I the worst. I can't, it's like I'm in my seat and I'm like ready to relax. And then that <laughs> crap comes on. I don't want to hear that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, Cause then you're done, right? You're not sleeping anymore. <laughs> you're not sleeping. And it's, and it, there's two different kinds of pilots. There's the ones that will tell you that. And they're like, to me, they're like the pessimists. Yeah, right. And then the other guys who I, I don't know which ones I prefer in the end, but the other guys I don't like either. The ones that they know there's a whole bunch of crap out there that we're going to fly through. They don't tell you a thing. And then all of a sudden thing. you've got all sorts of air pockets. Yeah. I always just look at the uh, flight attendants. If they get nervous, then I get real nervous. For sure. And that's a big problem. I actually look at the radar always. And if I, especially if it's a longer haul, like I look at for say across the Atlantic, if there's big patches of something. Yeah. yeah. Right? And I've, re I've rescheduled flights in the past, especially yeah, long yeah. ones when I, when I saw, I don't know, like a, a hurricane that decided yeah. to like roll up the coast or something. Yeah, that's interesting. Anyway, well, thanks for the chat, Brian. I hope this is helpful yeah. for everyone. That's a lot of fun. Hopefully it leaves you with more answers than questions. But look, long story short, there's a lot of opportunity here to roll some money into bonds. And I know a typical equity investor doesn't get excited about five and a half percent. But the question is if equity returns are going to be low single digits for the next five to 10 years. Do the math. Would you prefer to lose money or make five and a half percent plus, right? Plus, then you can still make money and build a whole portfolio with some equities on top of that. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, and, Serge. Uh, we'll see everyone back here in the next Study Wealth podcast. See you soon.